Hello, physicists. Uh, lovely to see you all. Uh, this is a little bit peculiar, but it's the best way I thought that I could get my notes from our physics lessons to you. Um, I've jazzed up my slides a little bit so they are as useful as possible. We've still got all the key information in red. Uh, any extra information which is not necessarily on the specification but is either interesting or takes your learning a little bit further or might be a, 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 a good example of an AO3 context where you take the knowledge you have and apply it to a new situation, uh, that will always be in black. And anything which is beyond the spec, um, so A level or beyond, is going to be in italics. Um, this is because we need scientists. Um, something tells me that the amount of funding going into science re uh, scientific research will increase over the next couple of years. Um, so you guys are going to be the scientists that find these solutions to the problems that we are facing. Um, over on the far left, uh, we've got some key questions. These will be linked to the topics uh, that we're talking about in the text. Uh, you might want to jot them down in your margin, you might just want to use them to test your knowledge as you're going through, but this is a new style of learning for everyone, so um, it's it's your chance to find the best way for you to learn. Um, this is really awkward for me, I'm not used to teaching to my computer, uh, but I'll give it my best shot. Um, there's probably going to be some mistakes, just bear with me. Um, but the lessons, I thought what we would do is we'll start off with the content. So we will build your knowledge. Uh, I'll teach you all the physics that you need to know for the exams. We'll go through a starter and the title. We'll go through the content and we'll do a little bit of cumulative quizzing just to keep that part of your brain um, kind of active as we go through, asking questions, figuring out the answers. There'll be some exam question practice, so you get to apply your knowledge to exam style questions. And then at the end, we'll have an, a plenary and I'll point you in the direction of some extended learning. After that, we're gonna do a little bit to look after your physical health. Um, so today we're gonna start with a stretch. Don't worry, nothing too active, but reality is you're gonna be in front of your computer for extended periods of time. So if we can just spend 10 to 15 minutes moving our bodies around a little bit, it will just help break up your day. After that, the most important part is going to be looking after your mental health. This is a really weird situation for everyone. Um, it is okay to not be okay, but the most important thing you can do is do things to build in breaks for your brain throughout the day. Just five minutes of quiet time, a nice activity to look forward to, or something that just gives your brain a little bit of time to reflect and to rest. Um, but if there's anything I can do to improve the structure of these lessons, please feel free to drop me a suggestion. Uh, this is just the idea that I came up with um, to begin with, and we'll see how it goes. So, on to our lesson for today. We're looking at radioactive decay. Last time we were in the lab, we looked at the three types of ionising radiation. There are two which are particles, and one which is a wave. Can you remember their properties? Can you remember their names? Pause the video so you can fill in this grid and see what you can remember. So looking at the answers, uh, we've got alpha, beta and gamma. Alpha and beta are our two ionizing radiations which are particles. Gamma is a high energy wave. So looking at key points of these, um, alpha has a mass of four and a positive charge of two, a two plus charge. It is highly ionizing, which means it causes other atoms to become ions. It rips those electrons off as it's coming past. Um, we can consider it to be a helium nucleus. It's exactly the same. Helium has two protons and two neutrons. Um, the only difference is in a helium atom would have two electrons in the first energy level. An alpha particle has no electrons. A beta particle, um, or beta, um, in comparison is just a high, um, uh, well, uh, an electron moving really, really fast. Um, it has no mass, but it does have a negative charge, a negative charge of minus one. Um, so it is a high energy electron. Our gamma wave, or our gamma ray, is just a very high energy 
um, electromagnetic wave. When we get onto waves, we'll look at electromagnetic waves in more detail, but for now, a gamma wave is just very, very high energy. Um, so these are our three ionizing radiations. Um, we're going to look in more detail at what happens for these different particles in this wave to arrive, uh, arrive, <laughs> arise. Um, so what does it mean for an atom to emit radiation? We're going to represent these as nuclear decay equations and we're going to look at what happens to the nucleus of that atom after it has emitted one of these particles or this wave. So let's start with a little recap. Um, we said that radiation is a result of unstable isotopes. When isotopes are unstable, they will emit either an alpha particle a beta, or a beta particle to become more stable. Gamma rays are also emitted, um, but we, we, we could have like whopping great big um, nuclei. So if we're looking right down the bottom of the periodic table, huge nuclei which emit radiation to become more stable. So for example, we've got three isotopes of carbon up here, not a whopping great big um, nucleus, but still we've got carbon 12, which is stable. It does not emit any radiation. It is a stable isotope of carbon. Carbon 13, also stable, uh, does not emit any radioactive, um, radioactive, <laughs> does not emit uh, any alpha or beta particles is stable, is not a radioisotope, but carbon-14 is unstable. It will emit radiation. It is a radioisotope, a radioactive isotope of carbon. Just to link to chemistry before we go any further, a fundamental skill. Can you work out the number of protons, neutrons and electrons in each of these isotopes of carbon? Can you also work out the mass, see how that links to the number on the isotope. Um, this is the best model that I could find on the internet, but I'm not 100% happy with it. Why might I not be happy with it? Uh, extra question. <laughs> how could this model be improved? Pause the video to fill in the table. Okay, answers. Now, fundamental fact. If it has six protons, it is carbon. Carbon's atomic number is six. That number links to the number of protons in the nucleus. Six protons, it is carbon. If it's got five protons, it's not carbon, it's boron. If it's got seven protons, it's not carbon, it is nitrogen. If it's got six protons, then it is carbon. With six positive protons, we need six negative electrons to balance that charge. These are atoms, not ions. They don't have a charge. We've got an equal number of protons and electrons. So now we're getting on to the mass number. We've got carbon 12. If we've got six protons, we would need six neutrons to make a mass of 12. With carbon 13, if we've got six protons, we need seven neutrons to make a mass of 13. With carbon 14, six protons plus eight neutrons gives us our mass of 14. And you can see that these mass numbers match up to the isotope numbers. This is how we name isotopes. So with carbon 12, we're talking about an atom of carbon with a mass of 12. Carbon 13, an atom of carbon with a mass of 13. Carbon 14, an atom of carbon with a mass of 14. It is still carbon because it's got six protons, but the number of neutrons has changed. With isotopes, isotopes have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. So, problem with this model, uh, I'm very unhappy about the fact that it's got six electrons in its first energy level. We know, uh, according to chemistry, that energy levels, um, we have two electrons in the first energy level and we have uh, up to eight in the second energy level. So we can show the electronic configuration of carbon as two, four. That is a better diagram. If anyone wants to redo that diagram for me, I'd be more than happy to update my PowerPoint. Um, moving on to another skill. So this is a lovely grid that shows all the stable and unstable isotopes 
of the first kind of one, two, three, four, five, six elements. Um, we've got hydrogen through to carbon. I would like you to use your problem solving skills to fill in this table. Um, I've put through four isotopes down in the first column. Uh, we've got boron 13, carbon 12, hydrogen 3 and lithium 6. Can you figure out how many protons, neutrons, electrons, what the mass is and then use the colour coding to figure out if it is stable or unstable? So, pause the video to give yourself time to fill in the table. Okay, answers. I'm not going to run you through all of them, but I'll run you through boron 13. So, we've got one bit of information. The atom is boron and it has a mass of 13. Or two bits of information. <laughs> boron, if we have a look, we can see the, the chemical symbol for boron is B. And we've got a mass of 13. So, just up there is boron 13. Reading down to the bottom we can see that it's got eight neutrons and because it is boron all atoms of boron have five protons so we can fill in the first two columns of our table just by reading off the grid. In terms of number of electrons if we've got five positive protons we need five negative electrons to balance that charge. We've got an atom not an ion we need to have an equal number of protons and electrons. With mass, we can add the number of protons to the number of neutrons to get 13, which is the same number of our isotope. Boron 13, it's got a mass of 13. Using the colour coding, we can see that it's green, so it is unstable. Here is another challenge. Uh, we've got some information, but we've got the isotopes missing. Can you figure out? which isotopes we are talking about. Uh, the last one will be a little bit tricky. You've got to figure out which um, isotope is stable with a mass of seven. Pause the video, have a go. Okay, answer time. Um, we <laughs> we've got uh, the tricky one down the bottom, that way, uh, lithium uh, is the only stable isotope with a mass of seven. So you'd be able to work backwards to figure out the number of protons, neutrons and electrons. <laughs> okay. Talking in more detail about radiation, we said um, that unstable nuclei can emit either alpha or beta to become more stable. And when they emit an alpha or a beta particle, they will also emit gamma radiation or gamma rays. So, alpha decay. We talked about an alpha particle being a helium nucleus. It has a mass of four and a charge of two. So, when we're talking about alpha decay, what is happening is a un an unstable nucleus is losing two protons and two neutrons in that alpha particle. So this is, as we said, to make the nucleus more stable. But as that alpha particle is lost, it causes the mass number and the charge number of the nucleus of that atom to change. So for example, let's say that we've got a large unstable nucleus. Let's say it is uranium-238, an isotope of uranium. We know it's uranium because it's got a proton number or an atomic number of 92 and it's got a mass of 238. As it loses an alpha particle with a mass of 4 and a charge of 2, the numbers of the numbers, the mass and the atomic number of the uranium atom will change. You can't just lose mass and expect everything to be the same. The mass is going to go down. But before we go any further, um, we are all familiar with alpha being the symbol for alpha radiation, um, but we are going to refer to it now as helium, um, so 4,2 helium. Um, this is standard notation when it comes to writing nuclear decay equations, so from now on, instead of alpha, we're going to refer to it as helium. Um, so we've got 
a uranium atom or a uranium nucleus uh, with a charge of 92. If it loses two protons, it's not going to be 92 anymore, it's going to be 90. If we've got a mass of 238 and it loses four, it's not going to be 238 anymore. 238 minus four is 234. So this is where it's kind of cool because what we can do is we can look at the periodic table and we can figure out what uranium would decay into. So on the periodic table, can you find the element with a, an atomic number of 90? Awesome job, thorium. So when uranium emits an alpha particle, it becomes thorium, thorium 234. So this is a standard thing that happens in alpha decay. We have a decrease in mass by four and a decrease in charge by two. Two protons are lost, so we go from 92 to 90. Um, this is a nuclear decay equation, and it is a lovely way of representing what is going on in the nucleus of the radioactive atom. Um, have a go at these three here. We've got three radioisotopes. We've got actinium-225, uh, bismuth-213, bismuth and americium-241. If the mass is going to go down by four and the charge is going to go down by two, what would they become? What um, elements would they become? What isotopes of those elements? Here's the periodic table. Pause the video and have a go. So hopefully you figured out that we would get francium-221, we would get lead-209, and we would get neptunium-237. Using those proton numbers, the numbers at the bottom, we could look up on the periodic table what they would be. Now this skill is beyond GCSE. They will not ask you to look on a periodic table to figure out which, um, which atom, um, the, it, it would decay into. Um, so if you're happy with this skill, you are going beyond GCSE, so very well done. Um, moving on to, no, <laughs> let's do a cumulative quiz first. Ah, oh, I can't even check what's coming up next, it's so awkward. Okay, so an exam style question. Describe what happens to the mass and the charge of a nucleus during alpha decay. We've got two marks available. So tell me what happens to the mass, include a number. Tell me what happens to the charge, include a number. Go. Yeah, I'm not gonna stand here waiting. Let's have an answer. Pause, pause if you need more time. Uh, mass decreases by four, charge decreases by two. Nice and easy, general rule. Um, and if we look at the periodic table, we can see that when the charge decreases by two, so uranium to thorium, we just skipped along two places to the left. So it's quite nice using the periodic table to predict what you're going to get from alpha decay. So now, beta decay is a little bit interesting. Um, not quite as straightforward. Um, so we said right at the beginning, when a nucleus emits a radioactive particle, it changes the number of subatomic particles in the nucleus. We also said that unstable nuclei emit alpha or beta. That makes perfect sense with alpha. We've got protons and neutrons in the nucleus, but with beta, a fast moving electron, this is where it gets strange. Um, talking about beta symbol, uh, rather than using beta, we're going to use a little e um, for electrons. So this is our standard notation for a beta particle. Um, and this is where, yeah, it's a bit weird. There are no electrons in the nucleus. So where on earth does this random electron come from? Well, if we consider our friend carbon-14 from the beginning of the lesson, uh, we said carbon-14 has six protons and eight 
neutrons. Now, one of these neutrons spontaneously can become a proton and in doing so an electron is emitted from the nucleus. We've got a neutral neutron becoming a positive proton and emitting a negative electron as that happens. Um, so instead of having eight neutrons we have seven. Instead of eight one of them has turned into a proton. So instead of six protons how many have we got? Seven. Perfect. So this is where beta decay is a little bit peculiar because instead of going from six protons we now have seven so we've changed the atom again it's no longer carbon it is something else but the mass is the same eight plus six that side is 14 seven plus seven is still 14 so our carbon atom has changed into something else how can we find out what it's changed into? Well, we can look it up on the periodic table. What element has a proton number of seven? Hey, right next door, one to the right, it is nitrogen. So our carbon-14, as it emits a beta particle, will become a nitrogen atom. Very strange. So, can you have a go? At these nuclear equations, they all follow the same rule. They're all emitting a beta particle. The mass will stay the same. We're not changing the mass at all. We're not losing anything with the mass. Electrons do not have mass, no mass whatsoever. But the charge is going to, stay, is going to change. If we're losing a negative charge, we are increasing the positive charge by one. So our general rule for beta radiation is the mass stays the same, but the charge increases by one. The mass number, the big number on the top, will stay the same, but the atomic number, the number at the bottom, will go up by one. Have a go at these examples. Pause the video for more time. I forgot to give you a periodic table. Here's your periodic table. Pause the video for more time. Mm. The mass stays the same, strontium-90, yttrium-90, but we've got a change in proton numbers. If the proton number changes, the element changes. So we go from strontium, which is in the lilac column, one to the right, yttrium. Sulfur, um, mass stays the same, sulfur-35, chlorine-35, but the element changes. We go from 16 protons to 17 protons. Helium-3, which is tritium, uh, a really cool isotope of helium, becomes, oh, helium, <laughs> hydrogen, hydrogen-3, uh, a really cool isotope of hydrogen, becomes helium-3. Our proton number changes, increases by one. The mass stays the same. Um, so, Cumulative quizzing. Describe what happens to the mass and the charge of a nucleus during beta decay. Okay, pause the video if you need more time. Um, think about the mass and a number, the charge and a number. Let's look at the answers. <laughs> mass stays the same for one mark. Charge increases by one. So, here is a chance for you to practice with some exam style questions. This is how they'll be presented to you. You will have a missing gap that you will need to work out either what the radioactive particle emitted is, is it an alpha particle or a beta particle, or if you're given the alpha particle or beta particle, work out what the mass of the new um, element is, work out what the atomic number is. Of the new element is. So for number one you're working out what kind of radioactive particle has been emitted. For number two you are working out what is the mass of the isotope of sulfur. You do not have a periodic table in your physics exams. If you'd like a periodic table now to help you up, help you out, feel free, but you can work out all of these just by the information on the question. Pause the video and have a go. So these are our answers. Uh, with number one, we've decreased in mass, so that means we've got a alpha particle. Um, decrease in mass is four, and the decrease in atomic number is two. 
For number two, uh, we've got a beta particle that's been emitted. So the mass doesn't say the same, but the proton number increases by one. Have a look through these answers. Give yourself a mark out of eight. We're going to talk about gamma a little bit, um, because as these alpha and beta particles are emitted, um, energy is also emitted as gamma rays. As gamma is a wave, it's not a particle, it doesn't cause any change in mass to the nucleus. And as it is a wave and not a particle, it doesn't have a charge. Um, so we've got a situation where just energy is lost. For gamma radiation, the mass stays the same and the charge stays the same. So when gamma radiation is emitted, we don't need to worry about any changes to the nucleus. But as alpha and beta are emitted, gamma is emitted as well. So, third question for cumulative quizzing. Describe what happens to the mass and charge of a nucleus during gamma radiation. Pause the video to answer the question. And the answer is nothing. The mass stays the same, the charge stays the same. Okay, let's have a go at some past paper questions. Uh, this is combined physics. So if you're doing um, not triple science, <laughs> uh, this will come up, but it is the kind of question that could come up on a triple paper also. So, have a look at the questions, have a go at the answers. And here are the answers. Question number two. This kind of question uh, could also be, it could be on combined or it could be on a, phys a triple physics question. Uh, this is exactly the same skill that we've been practicing, just laid out in a different way. We've got the nuclear decay equation and we've got a table that we need to fill in. As uranium decays into thorium, what is the number of neutrons? What is the number of protons for uranium? For the top um, box for uranium, you could either work that out or you could read it from the nuclear decay equation. For the number of neutrons of thorium, you're going to have to work that out. Pause the video if you need more time. And the answers are here. Uranium-92, you could read that from the question if you liked. So you can see up there, uranium-238-92. For the number of neutrons though, you had to work that out. Uh, 234 for thorium minus 90 gives you 144. So this is from the higher combined paper. Again, it could be on triple. Uh, what is an alpha particle? What statement about beta radiation is true? So if you're not sure, process of elimination here. What is not true about an alpha particle? Have a look at those sentences. Eliminate some. You can work out what the true answer, uh, what the correct answer is. Which statement about beta radiation is true? If you're not sure, eliminate the ones that you know are wrong. And the answers. Question three, it's not three. I can't even remember how many we've done. Uh, which statement about gamma radiation is true? Again, if you're not sure, process of elimination. Which ones are definitely not true? What are you left with? And the answer. This is from the triple physics paper, but it could appear on the combined paper. So it's good practice, even if you're doing combined. Americium 241 is an isotope of americium. Which isotope in the table? In table one is not an isotope of americium. So remember what makes an element an element. It's got this many protons. How many protons has americium got? Which one, A, B or C, is not americium? And give a reason why. And the answer. <laughs> So B is not americium because it doesn't have 95 protons. Americium has an atomic number of 95. You can get one mark saying americium has an atomic number of 95, or you could say conversely that, or not conversely, uh, B has an atomic number of 94. It's got a different atomic number. You can say proton number instead of atomic number. That's absolutely fine. Do, do, do. B, yep. Yeah. 
Here we are again, another question which could appear on combined as well. Which is the correct decay equation for polonium-210? So all three of them have polonium-210 with 84 as the atomic number, so that's all the same. They are all showing polonium-210 to be an alpha emitter, so they've got a helium nucleus with a mass of 4 and a charge of 2, but element X in the middle differs. Use your math skills to work out which one is correct. Why is alpha radiation dangerous inside the human body? Um, have a think about the properties of alpha radiation. What is it about alpha that makes it dangerous? And the answer. So we can see that if we're an alpha emitter, 210 minus 4 gives us 206. 84 minus 2 gives us 82. And the reason alpha radiation is so dangerous inside the human body is that it is very highly ionizing. It's got a 2 plus charge. As it whizzes past the atoms in your body, especially the atoms that make up your DNA, it is going to rip electrons off them. If you swallow an alpha emitter, um, not only is it going to be dangerous because it is emitting um, alpha radiation, which is very highly ionizing, so it is going to rip off those electrons. That is going to cause damage to your cells, damage to your organs. It is going to kill your cells. It's going to make you really, really ill. This is what happened to Alexander Litvinenko when he was poisoned using polonium-210. Um, he it, it was really hard to tell what he'd been poisoned by because um, one of the problems with alpha is it doesn't it, it's easily blocked by like a sheet of paper so the chance of it escaping from your skin once it's inside your body is impossible um so they were they were passing geiger counters over him recording no radioactive um substances whatsoever because it was inside his body and because it was alpha um, they just couldn't detect it outside his body. The only way alpha is going to get out of the body is when it's excreted. So when it's excreted through urine um, or through sweat or through other bodily fluids. So um, alpha radiation, not, or alpha radiation, uh, alpha emitters, really, really dangerous inside the body. Perfectly safe outside the body though, because they can't penetrate the skin. They're not very penetrating at all. Um, yeah, uh, Alexander Litvinenko, really interesting, um, terrifying, but interesting um, use of a radioactive substance. Um, ah, polonium-210 again. Uh, complete the decay equation. So this is another way it could be presented. Uh, we've got our missing numbers. So work out what isotope of lead that polonium-210 would decay into. Again, you don't get a periodic table in the physics um, exam, but you can work out the proton number of lead using these numbers here. Question two, explain why contamination inside of the human body by a radioactive material that emits alpha radiation is highly dangerous. Well, I just gave you three points. Uh, pause the video um, if you would like more time. Let's look at the answers. So our isotope of lead is lead 206. So 210 minus four gives us 206. 84 minus 2 gives us 82. Uh, answers for why alpha radiation is dangerous. It is highly ionizing. It's got a 2 plus charge. It's going to rip those electrons off. It's going to turn those atoms into ions, um, which causes an increased risk of cancer or oil, organ failure or radiation sickness or poisoning or mutation of genes or DNA or damages to cell, damage to cells, tissues or organ. Kill cells is an alternate marking point. Um, until it's removed or excreted or, ah, oh, nice, until it decays so much that it approaches background radiation levels. Uh, with polonium-210, um, yeah, that's not going to happen within a lifetime. Um, anyway, let's move on. <laughs> so that is all the information about radioactive decay. Um, you may have a beautiful sheet of notes at this point. Uh, your challenge is to turn it into a mind map. I would suggest starting with the title in the centre and then branching off into the different topics. You might have a branch for alpha decay, you might have a branch for beta, you might have a branch for gamma, maybe a branch for um, nuclear equations, 
Um, maybe even an additional branch for um, the notation we use. What are the symbols for alpha and beta? Why doesn't gamma have a symbol? Um, it's entirely up to you. Like I said, this is your way of learning. Um, so if you come up with some amazing ones, please email them to me and I can add them to future PowerPoints to give other people an idea of what to do. That would be awesome. Um, with your notes, if you want to send them to me for me to check over any answers, feel free as well. So taking your learning further, uh, this is a really cool website, which I found. Um, JLab has an amazing glossary, go away, um, of loads and loads of key physics words. If you want to find out a little bit more, have a look through their glossary. Also though, tip, we've got um, their index for students. Now this um, has loads and loads of resources um, for you to do, um, kind of extra science, but also right down the bottom, it's got loads of games. Um, my favorite one was Balancing Equations. That was really cool. Um, Element Hangman, very nice. Um, and Scrambled Science Words was very good fun, um, but I wasn't that good at it. So have a go at these games. Uh, if you want to go beyond GCSE, you can do a little bit of A-level work looking for quarks. Um, but it is entirely up to you how far you want to take it. Now, we've had a look at um, enhancing our knowledge and um, looking after our brains. So now we're going to look after our bodies. You need to make sure you're wearing something comfortable. Ta-da! And I would suggest putting down um, something on the floor. If you've got a yoga mat, that's very nice. Uh, I'm just going with a towel. Do, do, do. <laughs> there we go. Do, do, do. And it helps me make sure <laughs> that I stay in view as well. Okay, so we are going to stretch out all the major muscles and muscle groups in the body. Um, you're probably feeling quite tense being hunched over all day, so the first thing we're going to do is do a lovely spine twist. So laying down on your towel or yoga mat. Raise your right leg and just twist it over your body towards the left hand side. Put your right arm out to the right and turn your head looking towards your hands. You should feel a lovely stretch down the back of your leg. If you want to intensify it, just push down on your knee slightly. It should be a lovely twist in your back as well. If it hurts, stop doing it. We're gonna hold it to mild discomfort for 10 to 15 seconds. You should feel some of that tension alleviating. And then bring your leg back to the front. We're going to put the right leg down, raise the left leg and switch sides. So left arm out to the side, turning your head towards the left. And if you want to intensify it, push down slightly on your left knee. If it hurts, stop doing it. Mild discomfort, 10 to 15 seconds. So coming back to the center, I'm gonna raise the right leg, put your hands on your calf and just pull your leg gently towards you. You should feel a stretch down the back of the hamstring. Again, 10 to 15 seconds to mild discomfort. And then bring your foot down so your ankle is on top of your knee. 
right ankle on top of your left knee, thread your arms through, hold on to your hamstring and pull gently towards you. If you want to intensify it, push your right knee away slightly so you feel a big stretch up the back of your leg, the glutes and the hamstring. Ten to fifteen seconds to mild discomfort. And then we swap over. So right leg down, left leg up. I've got fluff all over my socks. Hold on to your left hamstring and pull your leg gently towards you. Ten to fifteen seconds. A mild discomfort if it hurts, stop doing it. Make sure your knee is soft, don't lock your leg out. And then cross your leg so your ankle is on top of your right knee, thread your hands through and pull your hamstring gently towards you. If you want to intensify the stretch, push your left knee away. slowly coming up. We're going to stretch out our backs a little bit further. Let's just go up. So find a flat wall or a door. If it's a door make sure it's one that someone's not going to come through. And we're going to squat down trying to keep our ankles on the floor. If you push your knees apart slightly Reaching behind you with your right hand, pushing your knee with your left elbow. You should feel a lovely stretch through your spine. Stretching out your lower back. And come back to the front. And the And back to the front. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Getting old. Okay. <laughs> we are going to stretch out. I can't remember what comes next. Oh, hamstrings. So, we are just going to... There we go. Very slowly, try and relax the whole of the upper body. Just let it hang, don't try and reach for the floor. It's not a competition, don't try and touch the floor. Keep your knees nice and soft, don't lock them backwards. Keep them nice and soft. You should feel a stretch up the back of your hamstring, just up there. Let your upper body hang. And with your right hand, reach round and grab the back of your left ankle. You should feel a stretch all the way up your latissimus dorsi. And then come and hang in the centre again. Shake your arms out. And slowly reach round to grab your right ankle with your left hand. Back to the centre. Shake out your arms and your shoulders. And very, very slowly start to roll. Oh, 
So we're going to stretch out our shoulders. This is where a lot of tension is going to be held from sitting like this in front of a computer. Now bring your arm across your body. What we're looking for is for your shoulder to stay back as we apply the, the pressure. If your shoulder comes around and ends up under your chin, you're not going to feel a stretch back here. So keeping your shoulder back, just apply pressure to your elbow and you should feel a lovely stretch around the back of your shoulder. If you don't feel it, put your hands down, reset and try pulling from there. Lovely stretch around the back. If it's all the way around like this, you're not stretching it. Shake it out and the other arm. So keeping that, elbow, that shoulder back, apply pressure to your elbow and bring it round. You should feel a lovely stretch back here. If it comes all the way round, you're not gonna feel that stretch. Keep that shoulder back and just apply pressure to your elbow. It takes a few times to get it. Once you get that stretch though, Really nice stretch. So, shaking out both of your arms, we're going to do a shoulder stretch where we're going <laughs> to clasp our hands together and just drop our head gently, don't force it down, drop our head gently to our chest. So, your chin is just moving down towards your chest. You should feel a lovely stretch all the way up the back of your shoulders. Just like that. And bring them down, shake them up. They're going to try and trust, uh, stretch the chest muscles. So coming behind you, grasp your hands together. You're just going to raise it slightly. It won't raise very far. Just a slight raise. It should be a lovely stretch across your chest. shake it out and we're going to stretch our traps so one hand above the head bend it behind and then with your other hand just apply a little bit of pressure going backwards you should feel a stretch all the way down here did I say traps I meant triceps And shake them out and the other way. So bending one hand behind your head, holding onto your elbow, applying that pressure. <laughs> so we're gonna finish this from arm circles. <laughs> okay, so just round and round. Backwards, then pause around to the front. Oh, hopefully, everything's feeling a lot more relaxed. So, the final section a bit of mindfulness. Um, David Williams is reading a book every day at 11. So, if you go to Audio 11, it's um, you'll be able to listen to one of the free audio stories. Um, this would be a really lovely thing to do if you've got younger brothers or sisters. You could maybe sit down with them uh, together to listen. You might want to do a couple of sketches of the stories he's telling. Um, it's entirely up to you. It's just a nice thing, a little bit of a break for your brain, um, something nice to do with a couple of other people. Um, 
So yeah, this is this is the first online lesson I've done. Any feedback, I would love to hear it. Uh, any suggestions, anything I can make better, just let me know. Uh, but apart from that, be awesome, do awesome things. See you guys soon.